Hello, everyone, and welcome to smartsocial.com. I'm Josh Oaks, and today we have an awesome interview with someone who has an incredible amount of energy, enthusiasm, but we're talking about a very serious, very serious issue. We're talking about screen time. Screen time, as you've heard from me before, we look at it as SAD. Stress can lead to anxiety, which can lead in students to depression. And that's why we are so serious about how do we use screen time in a positive way, whether it's together as a family or whether it's productive. And you've heard that from me here before at smartsocial.com. We believe these digital devices can be productive for your future so you can shine online. But let's back up the buzz just a little bit and let's talk today a little bit about how can we reduce our screen time so we can be more productive in person. And that is exactly the topic here today. And I am so honored to have my new friend, Sarah Christine, here from Los Angeles, joining me live for this interview. She's a former Disney executive, which many of you know, I started out at the bottom of the rung at Disney many years ago. We are talking to an actual former Disney executive, someone who did some incredible stuff there. We're going to hear all about her. Now, before we get started, this interview is brought to you by our free app, our smart social app. You can download it on iOS or in the Android store, and it has free resources to keep your family safe and smart online. You can download it today. Just go in there and type in two words, smart social. You'll see the green logo. Our team developed this to help people. We help about a million people a year all over the world with resources that give them a vocabulary on how to keep their kids safe and smart online. It's brought to you for free by our very own app. You can go download it, use it for free. You've got three new resources a week. Please take us up on that. If you enjoy this interview, you can rate the app in the app store. All right, Sarah, Christine, I'm so honored to have you here today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you, Josh. I'm so honored to be here. I'm very excited. I was like, this is such a unique experience for me. And so I'm really grateful to be here too. So tell us, uh, tell us really quickly, and people are dying to know. I know this because people love this brand. Tell us, what did you do at Disney? Okay, so just like you at Disney, I mean, I have to say it was probably one of my most favorite experiences. I still miss being at Disney because everybody loves Disney. And so when you work there, everybody loves working there. It's really exciting. There's always a high vibe. And, uh, and so when I, when I came in at Disney, I did come in an executive level. I was more on a lower ring executive level, but I did get a seat at the table. And I was definitely with a lot of uh, senior VPs and C-level people. And I was very, very, very grateful to be there very excited. I came in as an experience designer. So I came in to help at an executive level within strategy and finance to help bring together the experience that is so amazing offline and to help bring it back online. And so it was really, um, it was really a powerful few years for me um, to really be able to dive into, of course, the Disney brand and be able to see the best customers in the world are Disney customers. <laughs> and so, yeah. I mean, it was so fantastic. Are they customers or are they fans? They're fans and we are, yes, like we're the Disney advocates. Like, yeah. And I'm not correcting you. I'm just saying yeah, they're, I am one of them. I'm one of them. We're freaks. And, oh my gosh. Yes. you know, and, and I, I don't know if it's anything like you, but when, when, you, when you work there, I, I, I'm very close to my parents. But I think that my mom had like, and she loves what I, I do, but I think the day that I left Disney, it was like, oh, he's doing great work. You, you I'd be saving lives and be a surgeon, but oh, that's neat because, you, you know, that just that fandom that the world has. I, I am an, I'll tell you, Josh, I'm an ex-silver medalist for Team USA, and my family still is proud that I'm a, I was a Disney employee and executive over there. <laughs> that's the first thing that they were like, she had her own office, and she had all these executive privileges, and she would get us into the, you know, Disney, like, you know, the parks and everything. I think that that's probably my family's, one of my family's proudest moments. I mean, I remember being a kid and actually putting that down as one of my goals is to work for Disney. Wow. And I mean, just like you, I think my family we grew up on it and I didn't I just thought it was it's, it's it is it's full of joy and I just feel like uh, I just feel like such a heartstring gets pulled because I still still love 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 it and so just really grateful to now them. parents parents who are listening to this right now educators if you're thinking to yourself well this is really neat two people getting excited about their career that's great remember that we want you to inspire students 
to say the world is your oyster. We can do whatever we want as long as we create an authentic online persona of the skills, the hard work, the projects, the teamwork, the leadership that we're working on in the classroom, at home, in our backyard, whatever we're doing, the reason why we're bringing you Sarah here today is to minimize the downside of digital stuff and to maximize the storytelling that how you can help the world in an authentic manner. What we're about to talk about right now is not at all bragging. It's more like two people being full of gratitude and positivity, our favorite two keywords here at smartsocial.com. And we're really just talking about how can we get students inspired about their future so they have a reason and a purpose to shine online. Okay, now let's dive in. Sarah, I, I apologize for pausing like that because I just wanna hit home how people can be more like you, right? Yeah. You're very successful, you have your own business, you travel around the world helping people in a certain capacity. I want you to tell us what you do right now and then we're gonna dive into something unique that you did at Disney to force all of the executives to focus. And any parent that's listening to you right now or executive, I want you to listen to the story she's about to tell. And this is what got me going, wow, will you please be a guest? What you did with these executives who have attention deficit disorder, we all know them, we all have a, a CEO or, or a principal of the school, God bless you guys, you're great. But everybody that has a lot going on, there's a lot in their minds. And what she did with these awesome people to focus them is a story I think you can use in your home. Okay, now tell us what you do today. Oh yeah, so thank you, Josh. I mean, honestly, I'm an experienced designer at heart. So a lot of people call what I do CX, customer experience or strategy. Uh, what I do is I focus on experiences. So how, what does that mean? That is not just your customer experience, that is every experience counts. We're having an experience right now. Mm -hmm. I had an experience as an executive. I have an experience with my own team today as a founder and a principal at my own company. Um, I have experiences with myself every day. So each one of those counts and each one of those matters. And so what I do is I come in, I help people like my clients get better connected Connected with themselves, with their own teams, that leads to their frontline employees, and then out to their customer. Because I believe every experience, if I'm if I'm true to the experience that I'm having, so if I tell myself like I this is the type of experience I want my customer to have, then how am I being responsible today with my own words and my own actions so that that is true? Because I'm leading by example, right? And I do believe one of my favorite slogans is "Let it begin with me." So as an experience advocate, I look for uh, strategies all the time to see how can I innovate? How can I be more intuitive with those experiences? How can I create more well-rounded experiences as well as, you know, enjoyable? I mean, no, everybody wants to have fun. I mean, the jobs that we do are, and it's so many people, they're like rock stars. Yeah. I mean, products and services at Disney, like the same thing. I felt like that was rock star material. You know, I have a couple of sisters that are in medical and they are doctors and neurologists and surgeons. I mean, that's real emergencies. So what I really help clients do is really connect with themselves and their teams so that their customer experience is pristine. That's awesome. That's so true. And some of the biggest companies, the, the best companies have an amazing culture and that's kind of what you're working in there, right? Like we believe this and then they can serve the customer so much better. And just to tie it into full circle back to home, uh, educators, parents, what we have at home with a culture around how we use these devices will absolutely lead to how the students use them at school, outside and what they're doing with them. Now, let's talk real quick. Let's cut to the great stuff. You are awesome. You've got an amazing background, but tell us, what you did with some executives a few years ago, you were in a room and you did something powerful. You did something that was a little bit out there, meaning you were probably one of the younger people in the room because there's all these senior level executives. And here you are, an amazing person at the table. You come into this room and you realize that meetings were going way too long with all these executives at Disney. What did you do? Okay, that's a great, great start. So what I noticed was that we, these brilliant minds were constantly getting into a room together, right? And we're constantly working. So this could be even up to the studio president, you know, the head, everybody's getting in rooms constantly because we're always looking at every, 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 every experience, every little bit, which is great. 
but you have all these brilliant minds in the room. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of money at the table and a lot of people's ideas. Um, so five or six hours long later, that's a really long meeting. And so what happened was, um, you know, my dad always told me as a CEO, he's like, if you witness something that you see that you can change and you know you can do it, you've got to own it and you just have to start. So I was terrified because I was a younger executive for sure. And I didn't know that I really had a voice, but I saw this problem where we're going, meetings are lasting two, three, six, nine hours long. And I was like, there's, we're not really walking out with like direction and next steps. And so I went home one night and I had found um, wrapping paper from one of my niece's birthday parties. And I wrapped a giant, one of those boot shoe boxes because there was a lot of executives in the room and we all had two phones. So I don't know if a lot of people know, it's like you have your personal phone and then you also get a company phone. And so you have people in meetings. What I noticed when I was sitting in the room, I just was paying attention and people were constantly looking at their phones, right? So they're constantly checking their email or checking, you know, messaging somebody. And it's, I mean, it's all business related, but it would, it would drag the meetings on. So what I did is I wrapped up this giant boot shoe box and I called it the phone playpen. And so I came in with this huge box to this giant meeting. There's probably 10 or 11 executives in the room. And it was an opportunity for me to just say when it got quiet, people were like, I put the box on the table and they were like, what is that? And so I just said, this is our phone playpen. So we're going to do an experiment. And if it doesn't work, we can never do it again. That's totally fine. But I'm going to time. I'm going to set my phone in the box and with the timer on, and I'm going to time us. And I want everybody to put their phones in the boxes. So the first thing I th th that I realized, nobody likes their phones being taken away from them. Yeah. No, not kids, not parents. So people were, the executives, the men and women were so terrified. They were like, wait, wait, let me just text one more thing, one more thing. And then finally I had to walk around and say, You're, it's going to be right here in the corner. It's going to be great. We're going we're gonna to get it back. I promise you it'll cut time. Um, and so I kid you not, that box closed. We got to the meeting. So a meeting, that same type of meeting took four and a half hours just the week before. We were out of there in 27 minutes. Wow. People were like, oh my gosh, what are we, decisions we need to make? What do we need to say? Okay, yes, yes, no, let's follow up on that. It was so clear and direct. <laughs> and then people were rushing to the playpen box to get their phones back. So when we said wrap, everybody grabbed their phones. It was like, it was, it was, it was hilarious. I mean, honestly, it was quite eye-opening because I had no idea that we were so attached <laughs> and that it was such a drastic time spent. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And so they were probably freaking out. They didn't want to hand their phone over, right? Yeah. And as we all are, I mean, and yeah. then all of a sudden now they have no distractions. What was it? So everybody that's listening to this right now, I mean, there's a lot of educators that might be watching this who have students in the classroom that have these devices, right? That, or maybe they have to put them away or keep them in their bag or whatever that is. There's going to be a hack that all of us need to learn from you, Sarah. Whatever that is, we're, this, these are brand new I mean, in, the, in the course of the world and culture, right? And these distractions. So how do we figure out? So what are some of your tips that you might have on how can a normal company or family use what you're using? Like, should they do it around the dinner table? What tactics would you have for normal people who aren't in a big meeting? You know, that's a great point. So I think one thing is have fun with it. So I think having fun, I mean, I had stickers on it. I made it really crazy. I mean, I can't even imagine now when I think back, I thought, I mean, oh my, I must be a total crazy person because I walked into this, you know, to the office and I had to carry it in and it just looked like a giant thing come like just with stickers and bows. And it was something that was really fun and playful. And then eventually we all kind of got into it and we were all like putting Disney stickers on it and stuff. But I think the first things is to have fun, to have something that you're all participating so yeah. to lead by example that it's not just I mean I tell my nieces when we're there like to put the iPad down but I don't put my phone down so I think what it what's really important is that I do it with 
everybody, right? So we're all in this together. So mm -hmm. even like, you know, parents or friends that I know that have kids, if they create a box or they create some special place that's like a playpen for the phones or for their iPads, that they all go into those same place. So we're all kind of taking all of our, I mean, these are extensions of me. Like, I mean, I can't even imagine if yeah. this somebody said, I'm going to take your phone away for 24 hours. I mean, I would be really terrified. And so I think it's, just for little by little, like if it's at dinner time, at meals is really a great place, just like meetings, right? Because yeah. you're sitting around the table and that's an opportunity, just like in a meeting, to talk to people, you, you know, and <laughs> be able to kind of converse. Yeah, and that's incredible. And then also what you did was you incentivized it as well towards the end. And you said, if, if first of all, if this never works again, but I think what's a hidden thing that, that no one's mentioning right now that I think both of you that's implied in our conversation is that the things that are good for us are typically going to, they're going to hurt up front, like a good exercise. You're going to hurt that you're going to hate it. I was working out yesterday and I was like, this class is terrible. And I looked at my friend and he said I, he might throw up, right? He was literally, uh, it just wasn't good, but today we feel great. And so that's kind of what this is going. It's a little exercise. You're going to go into it. Nobody wanted to hand their phone to you. And we typically are so addicted. And by the way, parents, educators, these, there is a whole army of engineers and psychologists and experts and people behind every one of these apps, especially the UX UI design of this phone. They want to make sure that you do not put it down. They want to make sure that if it's in your pocket, you feel a vibration. You're thinking, wait, did someone text me? What's going on? You get those phantom vibrations. And, and that's what we're up against. So I'm so impressed that you did this. What are some other tips that you might have for us on how we can get people to maybe set those phones aside so that we can focus? You know, that's a great point because I think the, the other thing that I learned was, you know, that there's a fear of missing out. So I think we have this attachment. Like, I mean, I have my phone with me because we're talking about it. It's on airplane mode, but it's this attachment that I'm going to miss out on that one thing or, or there's a sense of urgency mm -hmm. instead of it really being an emergency. So the other thing I learned was when we went around the room and people were putting their phones in to be respectful, to say, okay, is there really an emergency? Now, a couple of people said, well, I have a meeting in an hour and I've got somebody working on it. I was like, that's not a real emergency. Is mm -hmm. your kid sick? You know, do, is, you know, is there somebody in, in the hospital? Like, do you really, like, what is a sense of emergency instead of it being um, what, what's so, um, how do I say, like time pressing for me to check my phone to see if I'm going to miss something versus it really, really being an actual critical moment. And I think that goes back to that mental awareness and that mental health. For me, it's that presence. So how can I bring myself back to being present with who I'm with, what we're doing, and it not being distracted? Because even in seconds of distraction, I've noticed, you know, everybody's had that moment where you're talking to somebody and then they do this and they're just, they're listening, but they're not listening. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, wait, what did you say? And you just kind of, you maybe have shared actually something that's important to you. Yeah. You know, those are missed opportunities. And I think that in the timing of things, it's actually the memory that is missed because yeah. I remember being in meetings, just like in meetings or with my nieces, and I'd be on my phone checking Instagram or checking emails. And I realized afterwards, what did mm -hmm. we just do? You mm -hmm. know, what just happened? Mm -hmm. And did I really remember? I feel like there's a part of my memories that are mm -hmm. trapped in this, in this phone that are not present in mm -hmm. real life. I, I love like that. Sad, yeah. Parents, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, how do I get my kids to do this? A couple ideas. One, replace the removal of the phone with a great experience. For me, I go uh, as a small business owner, it's difficult. It's very lonely sometimes. I have a staff and although they're great, we're always wondering like, what are we gonna do? How do we, how do we figure this industry out? So I go into a group of CEOs once a month and we all own our own business. And the rule is put your phone on airplane mode and for, a crazy seven hours. I have my phone almost all the time on airplane mode, except for when I check in. But one of the things I'm doing is a, I'm learning from the smartest people. I surround myself with people I care about that I can learn from. So key takeaway one, 
parents, uh, have your kids surround themselves with their best friends when they're doing this. Bring people in, have your friends or your students bring their friends over for dinner, whatever that is. Replace the phone with real people if you can and tr let's make it exciting. It shouldn't be, I'm sitting in my room and I have nothing to do. It can be an awesome experience. Sarah has put great people in the room and said, let's just remove one thing so those great people can be more productive. So that's one idea. And I'll tell you what, the day flies by. It sucks at first. But tip number two, and this is personal. Sarah, tell me what you think of this. But one of the things we tell students, especially on a digital detox, that we recommend every human take for one week a year. Take a week away, delete your social media, and, and see what happens. We always say, announce that you're going to do this. Tell people, hey, I'm taking a week off Instagram or whatever, TikTok. And I always announce that and teach students to do that. That way they're free to just go, the world knows how they can get a hold of me. They can still call and text. I'm just going to take some time off comparing myself and letting it consume my time. And that whole announcing to the world gives us permission to, to then turn off FOMO and delete the app a little bit more. Sarah, what are some of your techniques on how to get rid of that FOMO? You know, that's brilliant, actually, that you're having people do, like I read that you guys were doing detox, because I think that also includes with adults, because I have to take that separation too. I know there's retreats now and things that people are like saying, because it's going back. So I think going back to my tip would be going back to what you said it's what is the most important thing in that experience is that experience for the for you as parents to connect with your kids right so i think there's a lot of emotional and mental misses that we have where if we're distracted even slightly with these things coming in then it's like can i can i remove this also from myself right so i was leading that meeting i put my phone in that box too so it wasn't that you are leading by, you know, oh, I'm doing one thing, you're doing another because I know it's good for you. Yeah. I'm leading by example. And I think that those are really priceless moments because it builds up over time, right? So that experience of saying it's going to be more fun, it might be crunchy at first because it was, but when you see the payoff over time, it becomes more natural. So even at Disney, it became natural for people to walk in, they drop their phone in the playpen. Then after about a few months, we didn't even need to use it. People had their phones in their bags, they weren't pulling it out, they were more excited to get to work and just get wrap things in or find out what's going on next. And so I find that with parents and kids that they can do that too, that even if you have that one time in the day, right, for dinner, and you're just putting everything in the box, everything, and then you're having that experience with each other, I think that's also getting insights into where are your kids today? What kind of experiences did they have? Where do I need to look into and maybe see what else I can do? Or how can I follow up with this or that? Or, you know, really being able to find connection. I also like one of the things that you did that you, you said make it fun, but just the name alone, play pen makes it fun. You called it, you didn't say put it in jail. You, you said, put in the play pen, let them play with each other. And we're, we're giving ourselves freedom to go do this. And playpen sounds like a fun thing to do. Exactly. I mean, I, 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 my phone is like an, an entity. It's like, an, it's like a person. I mean, yeah. I press it. I have stickers on it. I have my thing. You know, so I make it mine. And so it's an extension of me. So I feel like when, if I had to put it down, you're right. It's, it's, a, it's like, oh, I'm, it's, it's going to play with all the other phones. And it's going to play with the iPads or whatever yeah. we have. And then I'm going to turn my attention and that's also practicing turning my attention to something else. Uh -huh. I mean, that's hard enough as it is. I mean, just to be able to say, I'm going to take one moment or, you know, and we started again with that one meeting, it was drastic, but I think what you could do is something small. Like you were saying, even if it's 20 minutes over dinner or it's a time period at night where on a Saturday night where everybody puts it in the box and then mm -hmm. you're just going to watch a movie, mm -hmm. um, you're just going to do something as a family or as a unit. And yeah. I do that with my own team because I think, like you said, it, creating that experience, the reason people want to be around people is because of people, because we're fun to be around and there's interesting conversations or we get to know each other. Just like there's so many interesting things that I'm, you know, not a parent yet, but I, and I'm not an educator, but I am a teacher in the fact that I have responsibilities. So when I'm in a cafe and I'm on my phone and I'm watching kids around me, I put my phone in my bag. Because I think if they can see me standing in line yeah. without my phone, then they can do it too. 
you know, they can, I talk to the cafe people, I might talk to them. Yeah. You know, I'm engaged more with the world going on around me and it becomes actually more interesting and fun. I didn't even know that that happened or, oh my God, I met this really cool kid and they're doing this really interesting project. And next thing you know, I'm engaged and I'm, you know, connecting. Yeah. And you're so much more than engaged. You're also creating because these make us, and I don't want to be on the bandwagon of us hating on phones, but what it does do, and everybody that's watching this right now, we are turning into a world of consumers instead of creators. Going back to Disney, what did Walt do when he created the mouse and everything else? He created things and he would look up at a wall and go, hmm, wouldn't it be great if this? And all of his designers and all the people at the, the Burbank uh, building where they first started designing things, they were creating things so that others could enjoy. But nowadays we're consuming a lot of information. So when you put that away, you started to create, which is a completely different thing. I don't think enough kids are doing that these days. They're not sitting there with a notebook. I know I'm gonna sound a hundred years old, but really getting that tactile, you learn 2.4 to 2.7 times more when you take real physical pen and paper notes or pencil or whatever. But you get the idea and, and um, you create when you put it away, right? Exactly. That is so true, Josh, because I look at my phone as a power tool. So it's not, it's not, it, it doesn't lead me, I lead it. Right. Uh, so yeah. It's not leading me. I'm not controlled by it anymore. I used to be. And I'm not. You know, I can put mm -hmm. it down and put it away. And what happens is when I create, when I do that, you're right, you're creating space. So I'm creating space for my imagination, and then my imagination kicks mm -hmm. in. So then I'm having a conversation with my niece or my sister or family member or my team member. And the next thing I know, I'm, I also do pen and paper because if I put it away, like there's like, you know, it's, it's like you put the phone away, but I can go back to my phone and I think, you know, I had this really creative post that I want to do, or I have this really creative thing that I want to say, or I heard a really interesting um, quote or something from a friend and I want to document that. So I think that that's where it kind of brings it back because I'm with you, like I'm an advocate for phones. I think that it's incredible. I mean, we are more connected than ever. I think the challenge is that we are also more disconnected than ever. Yeah. So it's kind of like, how do we find that balance again or bring ourselves closer to that? And I think that in order to do that, I have to separate in order to, to attach again. So it's like detach, attach Yeah. is like, this is bad, this is good. It's just like positive and negative. So each thing has a positive and negative and how do I weigh that today for myself? And, and especially when I need to focus, you know, I was the kid and we had to focus on homework. That was, I mean, it was, oh gosh, it was so tough, but we had to do it, you know? And then it's like now there's so many more distractions. Like we uh, had Yeah, can't imagine homework now. In fact, <clears throat> on that note, I wanna share just a little bit of an analogy that um, I was, I was in uh, Colorado a couple weeks ago, and we're always coming up with these analogies of how does the phone work compared to stuff we always know. Because a lot of parents these days are saying, it's probably okay to give my kid a phone. It's a whole new world. We will often relate it to a car and say, hey, here's the safety involved in a car. We'd never hand the keys over without fully understanding the kid understands we can take the car away at any time. They have to be safe. They have to drive safely. There's other dangerous drivers that could hurt them even if they're a safe driver. You know, all these, and parents go, oh, you're kind of right. The wisdom that we've come to know over the last hundred years of driving a vehicle is relevant for this. But I have another analogy that we, we shared that I think might be helpful for everybody listening to this today. And this is so on topic, Sarah, with what you're doing. In a speech, there was probably half students, 50 students, 50 parents, or something, maybe a little bit less than that. And we asked the students, hey, how many of you like ice cream? And all the students raised their hand. Like, oh, yeah. Okay, I want you to think of your favorite, whether it's strawberry, vanilla, Rocky Road, favorite flavor. Figure out what that is. I want you to think about that real quick. And we asked the students, all right, so students, pretend like you're at your house and your parents... Uh, go to the store and they buy a gallon. Have you guys ever seen the huge gallon of ice cream or it's a half gallon and it's in the paper thing, it has a huge lid. Think of your favorite flavor and they go to the grocery store and they buy that just for you. They bring it home, they put the TV on, they put Netflix on or whatever you wanna watch. They put that on, they get a big awesome spoon, they give you that gallon and they sit you on the couch and they go, here you go, here's your spoon, here's your gallon of ice cream. I'm gonna go in the other room and get some work done, sweetie. I'll, I'll talk to you in a few hours. And I asked the students, 
what would you do? And they scream out, we would eat it all, you know, and they're freaking out and they're like, cause they're engaged, ice cream, fun, awesome, great. And they yelled out, we're going to eat it all. Right. And I said, absolutely. Who wouldn't? I love, I have an ice cream. I'm just going to say it. I probably eat too much ice cream. It's, a, it's fantastic. And it's a treat and I enjoy it. Um, but they said that they would eat it all. And, and I told them, I said, exactly. And if your parents gave you that, that would be like every reason to just say, I don't, I might not know when to stop, but ice cream is good, but perhaps not the whole gallon because of the sugar, because we don't know when to stop. We might get sick. We might get full. And I told the students, it's the same thing with your device. You see, this is a gallon of ice cream and your parents are saying here, there's no rules. There's no time limit. There's no, this screen time is just like sugar. And if you went to bed with a gallon of ice cream next to your bed students, and you were actually able to eat it at any moment, what would that sugar do to your sleep? You'd be like, well, I'll just stay up and eat for a while. And then I'll oh, whatever, I'll sleep later, whatever. And it would totally affect the next day and everything else, right? And that's what this is, sleeping with this next to our bed, right? That this amount of sugar for our eyes is unlimited. And now we don't know when to stop. But instead, it, we, we told students that it's great, pretend like this is my little tiny cup that I have here, but <laughs> it's great to take a scoop or two and have fun, but in moderation. We know what the start is and the end is, and we treat ourselves from time to time. But that's back to the, you know, back to the main point at hand. The, what you did with those executives was say, okay, let's set our ice cream aside, guys, and let's focus on what we need to do and you can have it back a little bit later. That's brilliant. And also, Josh, it happens so fast. So even when I, when I set this aside, it's like, then you can get back to it. Because if I focus on the task, the task is done faster. It doesn't take forever. There's so many opportunities that I have a conversation and I'm present and then I get what I'm supposed to get. But I love that gallon of ice cream because I think that you're right because it can, it's a never ending gallon. This can, is no, this there's never ending. ending. And if I overeat it, then I also like, it's kind of like, I don't want it anymore. And there is that pressure too, that I think it's, it's everywhere. The pressure to perform, the pressure to be on the social, on social media, the pressure to say, I, when was the last time I posted? Who knows how many likes did I get? Where instead it's kind of balancing that. It still can be very important, especially when you're building for careers and you're building your positive outlook and your positive um, identity. But at the same time, it's also kind of getting in the way of your current experiences right now. Yeah. And we as adults, we're starting to learn the, a voc I call it a vocabulary of knowing how to describe what's going wrong, right? When we have too much screen time, and I find myself often doing this, I go, you know what? I, I need to do something different. I'm not myself. This is consuming my time, but it's also consuming my focus and my alertness and my happiness, my productivity. Uh, but students don't have that vocabulary. They don't have that understanding. They haven't been around until they're really 20 to 22 to sometimes 20. But let's be honest, guys age a little bit, they're usually a little bit long, younger on the inside. And so I would, uh, when I was at Disney, side, side note, my boss and I were very close and she came to me and she gave me, uh, I remember my 25th birthday, I was working at Disney and she put on, she put an article on my desk. She got there before I did that day. And she said, <laughs> People aren't adults until they're 25 years old, studies say. And she literally, I think I was 24 that day and my birthday was next week. And I got this article from my, adult, my boss saying people are adults at 25. And that's so true today because we really don't have a vocabulary about life. I would argue psychologists who are on this podcast who are way smarter than I am would argue that and say that our frontal lobes aren't matured yet, especially young boys, no offense, I was one, I am one, uh, we aren't mature yet until we've hit that certain age. So to give them ice cream, unlimited access, they won't know, the, the sugar will be lying to them and saying, no, this is good for you, keep going. And they won't know, they'll just, it'll affect their life until something bad happens. Exactly, and I love what you talked about, the analogy of the car. I mean, we're in, like, when Henry Ford built the car, there wasn't a manual. And so there was a lot of danger, there was a lot of accidents, there was a lot of things that went wrong because we had to experiment. So I feel like we're in that, 
experimental phase where we're like, wait, we're all in, right? Like how exciting, this is faster than a horse, right? So how exciting, this is, this is, I'm now in touch with every country that I possibly want, any person that I possibly want. I mean, that's almost like the, the world just opened and now it's overwhelming and there's so much excitement and I can see everybody's lives and what they're doing or how they perceive that they want to show me they're doing. And then it's kind of really cool, but at the same time, I think you're right. Like what you guys are doing, especially at Smart Social and what parents have to do is they have to create the manual. Like we have to be the ones to say, okay, what's balance? What does that even mean? And how do we even perceive that? And I think each parent is saying, okay, well, I know my kid and I know my life. So what does that mean for me? Because I think it's, again, like from my experience and experience design, the customer is, is, is so unique, right? So every customer is unique. Every client is unique, which means every person is unique. And so we get that opportunity by coming together as a community and kind of, and talking and saying, okay, what are some, what are some tools? And then trying those tools out. Because I think that, the playpen worked really well in the executive meeting. I've used it since with teams as well as um, with some family and friends. It was fun. It was fun at parties, like where people put their phones in and you know, just having a dinner party and it's like, here, set your phones over here and making it an activity of consciousness. Like I am consciously saying that I'm taking my phone out of my purse, I'm putting it in this playpen with everybody else's so that I'm, even when I go to the bathroom, I don't have a chance to, to check it. It's just being in the moment and having some fun around it. But I think it's also what you're saying, Josh, is bringing that conscious act to it, where I'm saying being and being transparent with your kids and with parents and teachers being you know, transparent with the kids mm -hmm. to say like, this is why we're doing this. We're just taking this, everything's gonna play together over here. And we're not doing it as a punishment or as something that I'm pulling away because it's bad. That's fascinating. You, you just said something really cool too. I love, and I wrote this down, forgive me for taking notes, but Henry Ford built a car. It didn't come with a manual. He didn't even have a manual before it. He's just saying, I love your phrase. It's faster than a horse. And you, you don't have to feed it. You know, you just put, you put a uh, fuel in it, but, but that's so true. We built something faster than a horse, but it can do something that no horse could have ever done. It connects us with people in a scary way. Um, that's, that's really, really brilliant. Um, I think I'm going to try that with my family too. It's really going to upset my mom because <laughs> I think she's the most addicted mom. If you're listening to this, I'm coming for you and she's going to hate me for an hour and I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, after she makes a delicious meal, I'll introduce this pro this thing. Um, <clears throat> cause mom, your cooking is amazing, but <laughs> Um, yeah, so this has been really, really great. Sarah, you are awesome. That enthusiasm is great. I really appreciate it. Um, what's one last tip that you'd probably tell professionals on how to, or adults, on how to set a great example for others when we have our phone out? You know, that's a great, okay, that's a great question because it's like I'm thinking about what would be that one power tool. And I think, you know, it is to say this is my power tool. I'll tell you one thing that I do in meetings. I request, because you're not gonna kill any trees if their notebooks have already been created. So it's, it's take the phone and it's not my note taker. So that's also something that I do where it's not, it's not my end all be all. So I can put it down. So I think from an experience is to say that I can I pick up a pen and paper and take notes. I can always have that at the kitchen table. I can always have that with anybody that I'm talking with. But I think also with the phone is to have fun with it because the phone is not the enemy. And the phone is actually this really strong power tool. I mean, I can't not, I couldn't have connected to you without my phone. And so that's really powerful. I wouldn't be here without my phone. But there, so there's a lot of positivity there, but I think there's also just knowing where to say, when is, it, when is enough? Like when is enough ice cream? When is enough? And I have to explore that. So I've binged on ice cream before. And so it's the same thing with my phone. I know that, that if I'm paying attention, if I'm on my phone too much, my eyes start to get blurry. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to feel, you know, tired or I'm worn down and I'm de I'm actually, my energy levels go down. Mm -hmm. That's my sign to say, mm -hmm time for me to walk away from my phone, take a quick walk go around the block, engage with my family, engage with another person, mm -hmm. um, just be able to do something different and then come back to it. It doesn't mean that it's all or nothing. It's just that, that be able to open up and expand. And it really has to start with myself. 
I love that. I love that you call it a power tool also. It's almost like a drill. It helps you do great things, but we, we look at a drill as, okay, it has a purpose, but it's not a pastime, but right. it can, it does things that we can't do with a screwdriver. You just can't like attach something to a wall in such a powerful way. I love that. That's a great example. We've talked about a lot. This has gone, this, I don't want to say it's gone longer than I expected. It's been so rich that it's been, a, it's been incredible. Um, I love that you, you um, consumer versus creator faster than a horse Henry Ford built a car without a manual. I love some of your tips on the, the whole playpen idea, making it fun, telling people, giving them a promise. You taught us that you should incentivize people saying, hey, we'll give it back and let's experience this and do that and have fun. And it doesn't just work at work. I'm already thinking about how awkward it would be to do this at home. Have you ever heard, Sarah, of people who get into an elevator and just to mess with people, they turn the opposite way? You know how we always look? You know, the experience is you look at the door. And, yes. Yeah, you look at the door. But have you ever seen somebody put their back to the door, like one of your freak friends, and goes, hi, guys, and it feels awkward? Yes, they're like totally like just making that. Like, You're like, why are you doing this? this is weird. Hi, everyone. It's super I, awkward. I, I do that from time to time just to mess with everybody in the elevator. Oh, I always have a friend in there that can laugh at it <laughs> with me. Um, but I think that would be super ex – this is one of those – Put your back to the elevator door and say, hi, everyone. Try that. Everybody listening right now, doesn't that freak you out if somebody did that? You're like, why would you do that? But it, that, that's what this is. Put your phone in a box. We're going to do 30 minutes without it, and we'll see the conversations we have. I think that would be really powerful. I think that is so powerful. It's, it's powerful to play that with kids, but really powerful with adults. Because I oh. think you're right. We, as adults, have to own the fact that if I took this away from everybody, I mean, they, that would be a temper tantrum. I would have one. And so it's being able to say slowly, okay, let me just detach with love and put it over here. And, and I, you'll, I don't want to dive in. I don't want to assume anything about anybody listening to this right now. But the first sign, we have some awesome psychologists and medical doctors on this podcast, uh, on our interviews. And they say the first sign of addiction is when we get withdrawals, when we can't take something away. I'm going to be the first to tell you, you guys don't have to admit to this, but I am definitely addicted to my inbox, my Gmail inbox, my inbox for my company, checking things. Like, is there some, is there some kind of feedback? And I am in this space as an alert person trying to help others. And if I'm addicted, then we are all kind of in trouble because definitely these things are designed to make sure that we're checking them often. It's so true, Josh. I mean, I know personally, I am. I am totally like, I love my phone. And so there's so many great things about it. So I've had to cultivate and learn as well, just like you on how to be able to say, okay, I can detach. It's not forever, it's minutes. But those minutes at first, they seem like hours, but 30 yeah. minutes is still 30 minutes. And you just do it little by little. I just found that just like you, that it was so much more rewarding because the connections were deeper. I got Oh gosh, I just got so much more from yeah. each person that I talk to. And it's been really, I mean, it's, it's really an incredible experiment. And I think that that's what I looked at it. If there's one last thing is to say, it's an experiment. So experiment with it. If that, if the box doesn't work, then maybe there's a basket or maybe there's like a fun experience where you leave everything in the backseat of the car underneath the thing. And then you're mm -hmm. going out to, you know, anywhere to ice skate to, I mean, right now it's like holiday time. It's what a great opportunity to just be able to say like, we wrapped up a package that's empty and we're all gonna put our phones in it at our Christmas party and see what happens, you know? And of course, like rightfully so, like being able to say it's just for a certain amount of time. I think that's also being really transparent with setting up your guidelines yeah. so that it's not so, oh, it's so extreme. I want to leave everybody with a little bit of a weird challenge too, because we're talking screen time. We're talking productivity. We're also talking a little bit of motivation. Um, and I want to challenge everybody. I want to tell you, share with you something personal that's happening. When I want to get stuff done around the house or something, I will actually put on cheap or expensive or whatever they are, ear, ear headphones, and I'll listen to a podcast or an audio book. And podcasts are free, which is amazing. And there are probably 100,000 podcasters in this country, maybe more. And you can listen to any topic. But I find, on a personal note, I get the most done 
when I'm listening, I redid my garage. I reorganized in three hours and it took me a few months to get the motivation. And then I podcasted and, or I was actually listening to an audiobook, but I got so much done and it flew by because I was, I was feeding my mind and all of a sudden my boxes were moving and everything was just going. So it was almost like screen time for my knowledge. I was feeding myself the good side of my phone instead of the bad. And I got things done. Oh my God. I love that. Cause I feel like we, why not use it as a tool? It's not, it doesn't even have to be on your physical body, but like you were saying, it was listening and that yeah. helped me focus. Cause I'm right there with you podcasts. I mean, any kind of music or that kind of motivations, especially when you're doing chores or you're doing yeah. something for work. I mean, that sounds really, it's, it's exciting. And it's also relieving to say like, there's so many opportunities for that, that I can be learning while I'm doing another task. And yeah. And if your students possible. are perhaps like, oh, I don't want to do it. I just want to watch a few more YouTube videos. Maybe there's a chance there to, to come to the middle. Okay. How about we find some podcasts, whatever you want to listen to. It could be fiction, nonfiction, whatever that is. And let's get you some headphones. Uh, we have a suggestion on a $25 set of awesome headphones that you can work out with or on Amazon. I have a couple pairs. We don't get the fancy, fancy ones, but whatever, whatever works for you. And um, get your kid listening, learning. There's so many new ways to do that. You don't have to take a traditional class. This is the key to everything. So any of your parents that are like, how do I get it out of my, maybe, maybe your kid should keep the phone. I mean, this is different for everyone. Maybe it's, how do you listen to that? Maybe get them $15 a month, audible.com subscription, whatever that is. But I think what Sarah's hinted at today is it's different for everyone. You have to make it fun for your family. Yeah, exactly. And you're giving choices, right? So audible versus, oh, I'm going to just watch YouTube. There's also really like, and then find the right books and take like the ones that you can yeah. listen to the right podcast that your kids are into something that is piquing their interest. Yeah. And maybe that's a together thing. Let's sit down at Amazon and let's go find the best books that are highly rated on this subject, drama, whatever that is, fiction. And all right, what do you want? You're going to get a couple of months. You get three credits a month or whatever that is. Um, this is yours. And if you finish it, then we're going to do these and you just, whatever that is, there's ways to motivate students. Sarah, you, you are awesome. I really appreciate your time here today. For all of you that are watching this right now, remember this is brought to you by our free app, Smart Social on the App Store. It has resources. I've got a whole staff that's powering it. We have three new resources a week, and it gives you the chance to keep your kids safe online, safety, and then mental health tips, which is what this is all about here today. And then getting your kid to shine online. So they're first Googling themselves so they see, wow, the stuff I do actually ends up online. And it is a part of my new brand. Every one of those results is your resume, whether it's someone else that created it or whether it's yours. Then we get kids in middle school creating a private portfolio. So they put their skills, their accomplishments, their leadership on there. And then in high school, they launch it into a public portfolio, which is a baby website about what they're doing. And it's authentic with what they want themselves to be in the future. And then they start branding their Instagram and everything else using what they have on their portfolio. We believe in launching your child into the future. And our hidden agenda is that not only your kid is safe and happy online, but they get a dream job. It does not need to be at Disney as an executive, but boy, if your daughter had that, boy, it would probably be pretty awesome. But there's a career and an awesome job for everyone, even if it's running your own company, like Sarah and myself. Thank you to everybody listening to this interview here today, watching this video. Please rate, subscribe, and review so we can reach you in the future and you can help us reach more parents to keep their kids safe and smart online. I'm Josh Oaks. Thanks so much for watching today, guys. We'll see you soon. Have a great day.